For a 10 year mission, they are saying that they went on a different planet that is 40 light years away. What they said here is that some of them returned, others not really. Drop a thumbs up and let's get into it. What if you were offered the opportunity to visit another planet? You'd get to experience the culture of an alien race, explore a new world, see and use technology that's 5,000 years ahead of ours. Would you do it? Well, before you answer, there are a few catches. You'll be gone at least 10 years, and when you return to Earth, all evidence of your existence will be erased. You have to start a new life with a new identity forbidden to tell anyone about what you experienced. Now would you do it? Well, in 1965, 12 astronauts were sent to an alien planet as part of a human-alien exchange program. 13 years later, they returned home. Oh, shit. I actually remember hearing this story and I never really watched any YouTube video about it till I I went uh, I, I found this video and discovered that 10 year mission to an alien planet that is 40 light years away they went on that planet okay and they kept it secret some of them returned some of them did not I don't know if I believe that one, if you believe that, two, if not, but knowing Y Files W channel, he will talk about why they did really go on the planet, and then he will talk about, hey, that never happened. I cannot wait for that in the video. Well, most of them did. The mission commander wrote a 3,000 page report of everything the team experienced first alien contact, the 40 light year trip to the alien world, and everything that happened on the planet. This is the true story of Project Serpa. True story? Oh, shit. Okay, I cannot wait till he just tells us it's when wrong. When Colonel McKeever Never of the happened. United States Air Force arrived at Fort Leavenworth, he was excited, but he didn't have much information. All he knew is that he was selected from hundreds of candidates to command the most important space mission in the history of the human race. That's quite a description. Naturally, he asked for details about the mission, but was told he would be brief during training. McKeever did know the mission was going to be long, 10 years, plus almost a year for training and another year in quarantine at the end of the mission. So 12 years away from home. It was 1965, so he wouldn't be back until the late 70s. Now, for most people, this would be difficult, but McKeever had no relatives, no wife, no kids, and very few friends. His life was the Air Force. As far as he was concerned, he could leave for 12 years or 20. It was all the same to him. And that was a good thing because another condition of the mission is that he was to be sheep dipped. Sheep dipped? Well, sheep. Um, so if they really went on that planet, that is 40 light years away, right? 10 year mission for 10 years. Um, how much is one year in Earth year? Because on a different planet, time is different, right? It can be different. Dipped is an intelligence term used to describe identities that are made to disappear. All records, military, civilian, school records, social security, DMV, IRS, it's like you never existed. No, I wouldn't mind disappearing from the IRS. I understand that. Tax is a theft! Colonel McKeever yeah, parked his car and was met by a young military police officer. After exchanging salutes, they walked in silence to an office building at the edge of the base. The outside of the building was nondescript, painted that gray, green, beige color that the military used for everything. The inside of the building was very different though. As a colonel, McKeever had been in plenty of secure buildings, but nothing like this. Metal detectors, cameras everywhere, armed guards posted in every hallway. McKeever's escort motioned to an elevator. McKeever asked, you're not coming with me? The young man said no, he didn't have clearance. He saluted and the elevator doors closed. McKeever felt the elevator taking him several stories down. He noticed there were no buttons in the elevator, no indication of the number of floors. The elevator doors opened and another young man was waiting. McKeever noticed his badge said Air Force Office of Special Investigations. As far as Colonel McKeever knew, OSI was a law enforcement agency. He had no idea what they would be doing here, but he knew not to ask. McKeever mm. entered the briefing room, which looked like a classroom. There were 11 people seated. He saw two Army uniforms, two Navy, and the rest were Air Force. At the front of the room was another Air Force colonel that McKeever didn't recognize, who told him to take a seat. The fact of the matter here is that there are a lot of dark projects that happen behind the scenes. There are a lot of classified uh, missions that happen behind the scenes. Most of them, I guess we will never know. And the problem here is that even if we know, even if there are whistleblowers, even if they come out and tell us exactly what's going on, would you really believe them? I beg to differ. I, you're not gonna believe it. In this day and age, especially when we're talking about deepfakes, 
nowadays we're at a point where you cannot even believe a live stream you're watching this live stream right might be fake i might not be real i might be an ai guys i'm real actually let me actually get my fingers around here i'm real but but the but the point here is that they are ai streamers streaming on twitch and youtube and you do not even you think they are real humans and you don't even know deep fakes are going crazy right now and eventually and i think starting even now they will not be taken evidence audio evidence video evidence as facts it's really getting to the point where it's ridiculously hard to know what's real and what's not and if a whistleblower comes out got all the evidence are you then gonna believe him 10 years ago if that evidence was substantial and good enough probably in this day and age mm, deep fake i don't know i don't know thoughts the other colonel said to the group what I'm about to show you is classified beyond top secret. There are fewer than 60 people in the world who know this information. If you repeat what you learn here today, you'll be charged with treason. Understood? The group nodded slowly, clearly aware of the weight of the situation. The colonel oh, pulled shit. down a screen and called to someone to get the lights. On the screen, a black and white film began to play. The first few seconds were the typical warnings about unauthorized viewing and other disclaimers that Colonel McKeever had seen a thousand times. The footage showed what appeared to be the desert at night, though it was hard to tell, the footage seemed to be 20 years old. Then a title came on the screen that McKeever didn't expect. It read, Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, First Contact. Do you believe in Roswell? One, if you believe in Roswell, two, if not. Those of you that do not know, Roswell was apparently the first contact, and this is first contact, first contact with aliens, because around that time we were in World War II and 1945 is when it ended, because we blew the, the nukes, they were attracted by it. That's, that's what we hear all the time, that the, they did not want it, us to blow over planets. They were very concerned uh, about, uh, hey, these kids are playing with matches. They're playing with fireworks. They should not be playing with these uh, nukes and uh, stuff like that. So th this is why they, we started having like a lot of sighting. 1947 was Roswell when a UFO crashed. First they said it was a UFO, then they said it was not. It came in paper and they said that it was just a balloon, right? Around that time we... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll talk about that later. The film lasted about an hour and left everyone in the room stunned. They had heard of Roswell and the supposed UFO crash. The Air Force said it was a weather balloon and that explanation was good enough for McKeever. The film explained that the UFO crash in Roswell did happen, though technically the crash was in Corona, New Mexico. And two years later in 1949, another UFO crashed nearby. Now, this was something McKeever didn't know. And there was footage of the Roswell recovery. At first, it was difficult to understand what he was looking at. It was clearly metal wreckage, but it could have been a plane for all McKeever knew. Then he saw it. Hiding behind a rock was an alien. It looked like aliens look in science fiction movies. Short, pale skin, large head with huge black eyes, small nose and mouth. The military called- It's always like that, always. Big eyes, small nose, ears. Do they even have ears? I, we don't even know, right? It's always like that, always like that. This creature, Extraterrestrial Biological Entity 1, or EVA-1. EVA-1 was the lone survivor of the crash. Five other alien bodies were taken away. There was also footage of the 1949 crash. It was a similar craft, silver, saucer-shaped, and there were six bodies there and no survivors. EVA-1 was taken to the Air Force facility at Los Alamos, and according to the briefing, he stayed there until his death in 1952. The Air Force learned a great deal from EVA-1 in those five years. And this is one of those stories that has been going around for decades even that the Roswell crash was actually real, it for real happened, and they had survivors from that crash. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And they lived uh, a decent, healthy life, and they spoke, and we, we talked with them, and we communicated. Because now, when, you, when we talk about first contact, right? The first thing is that if it really happens, are they going to be able to understand English? You know this, right? We cannot even talk with uh, with animals. Dogs are probably the most intelligent one. You can argue dolphins, but dogs, they understand, but we cannot directly communicate. So even the species that we have on our own planet, we cannot directly communicate with them. We have so many thousands of languages, we cannot directly communicate with our own people right not everybody understands the same language 
aliens different planet altogether how is it possible we can communicate how are we gonna able to communicate when we first have this first contact telepathic communication is something we hear all the time maybe it's true maybe it's not the the point here is that if we really had this first contact back in 1947 did we really had the survivor was it really aliens we had did we really communicate it and did they really understand and did we really understand them thoughts at first communication was difficult Ibo One's language was comprised of tones, not words. But through hand gestures and repetition, Ibo One was able to communicate. He said that his race, which the military called the Ebens, had been visiting Earth for 2,000 years. On this trip, something caused his ship to crash. Ibo One suspected it was radar, which was a technology his people didn't have. Some equipment was salvaged from Ibo One's craft, specifically a communication device. Ibo One offered to share this technology if the military would allow him to repair it so he could contact his people. Of course, the military agreed. Ibo One was able to get the communicator working again and sent several messages but never received a reply. And this could have been due to a number of reasons. Ibo One's home planet, which the military called Serpo, was in the Zeta Reticuli system, almost 40 light years from Earth. The Ebens used wormhole technology to travel and send messages back and forth. After Ibo One died in 1952, the Air Force tried but was unable to reverse engineer other alien technology. But they did have a working communicator. So the Air Force continued to send messages for years. The persistence paid off. Eventually, they received a reply and two-way communication between Earth and Serpo continued for a long time. The Ebens even learned to speak broken English. After learning about the crashes, the Ebens wanted their crew's bodies back, but the military being the military wanted something in exchange. Oh, let me guess. They wanted technology. Yep. Technology. But the Ebens said it would be too dangerous to give humans their technology. I could have told them that. Bruh. So the Ebens suggested a compromise. The military would return the bodies of the alien crew. In exchange, an Eben would come to Earth and assist the U.S. Army. And 12 humans could spend 10 years on planet Serpo. This became known as Project Serpo though its actual name is Project Crystal Knight. And so began the first intergalactic exchange program in history. Man, the, the thought alone of humans having contact is nuts. It's just nuts, right? And then to further go ahead and be like, yeah, 10 year mission to an alien planet that's like 40 light years away. How are you going to get there? Okay, aliens came here and for real, we used their ship and they took us there. Okay, understandable. 10 years on an alien planet. That is nuts. I cannot wait till he reveals the fact that it was all fake. But he started off saying it's actually real. MC, MC Juicy, love you, man. Thank you, brother. Welcome the training on. was intense and long, a year. Colonel McKeever thought special forces had a difficult training program, but it was nothing like this. There were the usual physical exercises and classroom training. They trained in survival, escape and evasion techniques, weapons, explosives, and intelligence gathering. They also learned about Eben history and Eben biology. But there was aggressive and invasive psychological training and testing. McKeever remembered one unusually difficult exercise designed to test the team's ability to cope with isolation and confined spaces. Mm. Team members were buried seven feet underground, one at a time, in a seven by five foot box for five days. No lights, no way to communicate. Only a small air hole and food and water. Everybody passed this test, but some people really struggled with it. Oh, come on! Five by seven feet is a palace! <laughs> Grow up here! During training, McKeever got to know his team. There were scientists, linguists, pilots, two doctors, and a security officer. They all received general training and training geared toward their specialty. For example, the pilots were taught how to fly an Eben aircraft. This what? was surprisingly easy and apparently a lot of fun. The Ebens returned to Earth in 1964 to retrieve the bodies. This happened at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And there's actually footage of that landing. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Bob Lazar! Bob Lazar! Thoughts on this one real quick. If you have been following Bob Lazar, one if you have been following, two if not, Bob Lazar is one of those guys that I actually believe. I really do believe because he has been keeping his word. He has been saying the same thing for years and years, never really changing his word, never really selling stuff. He recently made a movie, but he did not profit off of that. It was the guy who made the movie who did that, right? He took some friends 
and, and basically they saw a UFO as well. He wanted to prove, and it for real happened, and he did record. Uh, but but the sad thing is that it was at night, and it was years ago, decades ago, in fact, that we didn't just have the cameras for that, right? The quality was so bad. You look at it, and you do not necessarily know what's going on, but the, the fact here is that he did say that the UFOs would appear, and... For some weird reason, it actually appeared at the time he mentioned and the day he mentioned. Oh shit! Oh shit! Yeah, and uh, this story uh, is just nuts, man. Are we ever gonna find out the truth in our lifetimes? I don't know, man. I don't know. So this is the alleged footage of them coming. I don't know, man. About I a year wait. later, in July 1965, Four. the team traveled to Groom Lake, near Area 51, for the landing. At 6 a.m., the Eben ship landed. Several Ebens came out to meet the team of 12 and about 16 military officials. The human team was allowed to bring whatever they needed for the stay. They brought 40 tons of gear. Sorry for pausing here, but it's a good question. Mr. Two Times says, I feel like Bob Lazar is legit to an extent. Do you really think that Gurman would let a whistleblower like that survive? Good question, and I do believe that they would not as well, but the the counter argument to this one is that initially when he leaked that, when he whistled blue, when he blew the lid off, the reason he did, he was actually scared of his life. He didn't know that they were going to kill him or not. He was actually wrong. Later on, he said that, I wish I kept my mouth shut because they were not going to kill me off. They were just worried about what was happening behind the scenes in his... Uh, marriage right like in his love life there were certain things that were happening and they were really concerned about that and, and this but he thought they were trying to kill him because he had a lot of information he knew too much and he was basically advised by a journalist i'm not i don't remember his name now this is why he came forward so basically the insurance policy was that you're gonna come on we're gonna see your face you're gonna be on on tv you're gonna tell everything and if you die that means you're telling the, the the truth if they kill you you're telling the truth and they never killed him so yeah here including 10 motorcycles and three jeeps everything was easily loaded using anti-gravity technology now lucky for that us too, yeah, mckeever was ordered to keep diary okay we loaded everything and it fits but we have to transfer all of it to the bigger ship once we get to the rendezvous point really excited about this no reservations by anyone the training commander asked all members to make a final decision. The team all said go. We go. Interior of Eba craft is big. There are three levels. This is different than the one we trained on. I think that was a scout craft. This one is a shuttle craft. The shuttle flew into a large ship. McKeever wrote that the shuttle bay ceiling was about 100 feet high. It would take almost 10 months to get to Serpo. The human team was escorted to the area where they would be spending the next 270 days. Each team member was assigned a small pod, each with a single chair, no seat belts or harnesses. McKeever was surprised that gravity was consistent. He was expecting to be weightless. Then he saw a light panel change from white to red. He assumed this meant they were moving. His eyes became blurry, the room started to spin, and then he blacked out. Mm, man, the... The, the, thought, the thought alone is just insane to me. Uh, one, if you actually are really fascinated by this topic. Two, if you're not. Let me see that. And uh, Bob's birth certificate didn't exist for a while. They tried it. Yeah, that's actually the really suspect part. When they really tried looking for... Uh, like, when they really tried looking for evidence and when they really tried to look in Bob's uh, Lazar past, it was almost as though he was an alien, right? When I say alien, I mean to say there is no proof of his existence and, and that is the crazy part it's like you don't if you're trying to dig somebody's past you're gonna find stuff all right you're gonna find where he was born at least his birth certificate he was born right let's keep about 50 here they shouldn't they the feds shouldn't have tried if they really wanted to prove him wrong they shouldn't have went ahead and erased his birth certificate and stuff like that his like college uh, his uh education background was kind of erased as well from what i've learned that is just insane you do not erase, erase education and and birth certificates those are like normal stuff if they if that doesn't prove or that doesn't disprove bob's story 
if they found his birth certificate, all of a sudden it doesn't mean that he's speaking the truth. It doesn't mean that he was lying. It just means that, yeah, he's he's born just like you and I. We were also born. We also got birth certificate. We were born in a government hospital, right? Or some people were born in a private hospital. But that's besides right. the point. But the point is that when you're born, you have the, the, the birth certificate. The fact that they erased that, that is just uh, truly insane. And I feel like that adds more credibility to Bob Lazar case, even though their point was not to add any more credibility. The journey was difficult. The human team spent a large part of 10 months sick. They right. would often become dizzy than, and sometimes yeah. physically ill. During one part of the journey, and even gave the humans a cloudy liquid that tasted like chalk and a cookie or a biscuit that had no taste at all. But when they ate it, they felt better almost instantly. After a while, the human team was allowed to move around the ship. We were able to walk around the ship, but it's so large, it's difficult to understand how such a large ship can move so fast. 633 wants to see the engines. Our guide takes four of us to the engine room, or whatever they wish to call the room. It contains large, very large metal containers. They are in a circle, with the ends of each pointing into the center. Many pipes or some type of large tubes connects them. In the center of these containers is a copper-colored coil or something looking like a coil. There's a bright light being shined from a point above into the center of the coil. We hear a very dull hum, but no major loud sounds. 661 thinks it is a negative matter versus positive matter system. One day, toward the end of the journey, McKeever got out of his pod and asked the assistant commander, team member 203, to round up the team. 203? Yep. Team members were now required to refer to each other by their number and not their name. Oh, because they were dipped in the, uh, the sheep thing? Sheep dipped. So 203 rounds up the team, but there's a problem. One of the pilots, team member 308, is missing. McKeever asks what happened to 308. One of the Ebens says, Earthman not alive. Uh-oh. McKeever mm. asks to see him, but the Ebens say that's not possible. The security officer, team member 899, says, I'm going to get the guns. Part of the gear the human team oh, brought included weapons. They were each issued a rifle. They had handguns. They also... Bruh. Like, so the humans thought that they're... You are in their territory now. You are... If this is to be believed, you are in their UFO ship. Do you really think your weapons would work, man? But they... But obviously, they will try to bring their weapons and... So had grenades... Th this sounds logical because the first thing humans do is oh shit we gotta get ready for war right something bad happens you're thinking negatively all of a sudden you're thinking about throwing punches in this case they were throwing uh they were thinking about getting to their weapons and shooting that's insane that's whoever uh, if the story is fake whoever made the story up he's a genius i mean he's using natural human uh instincts right and C4 explosives. 899 begins to storm off when a female Eben, who speaks flight. very good English, says, please, no guns. She explains that 308's body is in quarantine until they can figure out what happened. The Ebens allow the human doctors, 700 and 754, to examine the body. They determine 308 died from an embolism, but the Ebens want him to remain quarantined. McKeever agrees, as long as 308 can be given a proper burial on Serpo. Not long after that, the humans are instructed to return to their pods and prepare for landing, which they do. There must be something about jumping in and out of a wormhole that's hard on human anatomy because McKeever blacks out again. Boy, this guy really can't hold his wormhole. Mm. Six hours later, his pod opens and his team walks to the door. Slowly, the door opens. Damn, slowly the door opens. Ten year mission to planet The door Cap. opens and bright light washes Bruh. into the craft. The team members were issued heavy-duty sunglasses, like those worn during nuclear bomb tests. They quickly put them on. The first thing McKeever noticed was the heat. He asked one of the scientists, team member 633, to check the temperature. 107 degrees Fahrenheit. The landscape is barren. There are hills in the distance, but no vegetation. Just soil and rock and blue sky above. McKeever thinks it looks like Arizona or New Mexico. One major difference, two suns in the sky. McKeever's Damn. report supposedly has several thousand photographs and even film. Unfortunately, these haven't been leaked, except for one photo. The two sons... The crazy thing here is that somewhere... Let's just be real about this, right? Let's say this story is not real, okay? We're gonna find out if it's real or not. Chances are he will debunk it and say it's not real. But somewhere, there are billions of galaxies, billions of planets. Somewhere, there's gotta be a planet that is similar to ours. Maybe there's life, maybe there's none but similar to ours, 
but with two suns, maybe even three suns. Just the thought alone is crazy because sun is also a star. It's a star, right? And there are trillions. Um, I, I think it would go even beyond trillions. I, I do not know maths after trillions, okay? Like, let me just Bruh. think about 50 here. But somewhere, just the thought alone of having like two, three suns, it's just insane. It truly is insane. Because of Serpo. Serpo is in the Zeta Reticuli binary star system. Because of its two suns, Serpo is never in complete darkness. According to the report, Serpo has one main sun that the planet orbits, the second sun is farther away. A large number of Ebens have gathered for the arrival. They're all a little over four feet tall, and the human team can't really tell them apart unless they're wearing different clothing. A female right. Eben, who they designate Eba 2, introduces herself as translator and guide. The human team is escorted through an Eben village to where they'll be staying. And for a technologically advanced species, the way the Ebens live appears somewhat primitive. There are only about 650,000 Ebens on the planet who live in small communities. At the center of each community is a large tower about 300 feet high. On top of the tower is what looks like a mirror. The humans learn that this tower is how Ebens tell time. This was a difficult adjustment because the Eben day is 40 hours long, not 24. And with there never being darkness, it was hard to adapt their schedules. Eben families were similar to Earth's typically a female and a male with two children. Families were only allowed to have two children, and children were rarely seen. They mature very quickly and are isolated while they're young. I mean, this is how you control the population, okay? You do not, because if you let people do Easter eggs all day, every day, you know, that, that just for example, right? If you let, if you have two cats, one male and one female, my guy, you let them in your house, just wait a couple of days, and all of a sudden, you got 10 of those motherfuckers running around. <laughs> running around. So they do be doing Easter eggs like crazy. So I think that's a good policy. Uh, keep it keep it to two. Two is uh, uh, very, very good. But here's another thought, right? Because when you think about aliens, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Do you think that they will also have flesh like us? Do you think that they will be similar in terms of looking like us? Or do you think they will be like Transformers, like robots, like AI? What, what what do you think more? Uh, I, I go the, the route of them being kind of closer to us, looking almost identical, and having a fl having flesh just like us. Surely they would be different looking, but I don't think it will be like Transformers where they are completely robots. Now, there could be a civilization out there that have created robots and, and that are acting as their own selves that are. It's just like on our planet, you if we're alive in the next hundred uh, years, we're probably gonna have, you know, robots running around, walking around that would be themselves and shit like that. The thought alone is terrifying, actually. If you played that game, Detroit Become Human, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I do believe stuff like that can happen. But, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I believe that they would probably look closer to us maybe different skin color maybe different measurements 100 percent but they're uh because whenever we hear people describe the whistleblowers describe or people in government describe whether you want to believe them or not whenever they describe they always describe them looking like us two eyes nose mouth ears but 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 the fact here is that those eyes are bigger head is bigger but people that describe they always say they have a head they always say they have eyes which is just insane because if you believe in god i do believe in god uh so it's it's just seems logical to me that if god has made us then he probably have a, uh, his creation somewhere else as well just our planet alone ocean is an alien planet we have so many different species they find 18,000 new species every year so if god has created us and created all the species that we have in our ocean uh animals you look around animals it's uh, it's just insane right there gotta be somewhere uh, something else out there and maybe god was uh, kind of feeling bored maybe god was lacking that creativity like those call of duty devs out here and he's uh, making similar people like us but some got bigger eyes some got smaller eyes some got bigger heads some got smaller heads it's uh not disrespecting god i'm just joking around i i'm a believer but but yeah i don't believe that they would be like transformers like robots uh yeah you came a little bit late for gta 6 but check out the pin comment or you can rewind the stream or you can stay tuned and then check out the uh rewind the stream the even homes were small domes that reminded the team of adobe houses in the southwest Lost the humans finally arrive at their accommodations 
Ibitu leads us to a series of huts, looking like adobe-style houses. There are four. Behind them is an underground room or storage area. It is built into the ground, underground. We have to walk down a ramp. The doors look like military igloos that store our atomic bombs in Earth. All our gear taken off the spaceship is stored there. We walked down into this area, very large room. Very cool, a lot cooler. We might have to sleep here. All our gear is there. 16 pallets of gear. This igloo is made up of something like concrete, but not the same texture. Feels like soft rubber, but flare. still hard. The floor is made up of the same stuff. There are lights in the ceiling. Looks like spotlights. They have electricity. Each home was equipped with an electrical device that looks like a small piece of plexiglass. No matter what's connected to it, the device outputs the correct amount of voltage. These devices could power a small handheld radio or an entire home without a problem. Supposedly, one of these devices was recovered from Roswell, but scientists haven't been able to reverse engineer this technology. Allegedly. Right. Now that they're finally Allegedly. on the planet, McKeever requests the body of team member 308 so they can give him a proper burial. Eba-1 takes McKeever to a building that looks like a medical facility. An Eben doctor meets them at the door. He speaks English almost perfectly. McKeever what? says he wants 308's body. The Eben doctor is confused. He says you can't have him. McKeever says, give us our man or we'll take him by force. Yep. Eba-2 jumps in. She says it's not that they don't want to return 308's body, it's that they can't. The doctor confirms this and says we're using him. McKeever asks what he means. The doctor casually says, well, we're cloning him and using him to create hybrids. Damn. The thought of like humans just be like, okay, we're going to use force. That's like just insane. They recently shot down some UFOs, whether you want to believe it or not. They never, first they said that they're not ruling out ET. Then they said that they couldn't find the wreckage. It, uh, Project Blue Beam was trending as well. If you're watching this live on a stream, Scary X, that's the second channel. Uh, go, uh, go there. I, I uploaded a Project Blue Beam video not long ago as well. Uh, subscribe to this channel. This is where this content is going. But if you're watching this on Scary X, then yeah, Project Blue Beam video piece that started trending there's some crazy stuff happening uh you should not believe everything but you should also not dismiss everything either obviously cloning a member of the team without permission was a problem but mckeever heard the doctor out when even it was considered a great honor to donate your body to science for experimentation and cloning mckeever doubted he could do much about the situation the evens were peaceful but they did have a military if they wanted to put the humans in prison or worse McKeever knew there wasn't much he could do about it. We were only 11 military personnel. We had no way of fighting the Evens. We did not come 40 light years to start a war with the Evens. A war we could not win. We could not even win a simple fist fight with the Evens. Even if we could, what then? So with the help of Eba 2, the doctor agrees that 308's body will not be used anymore. Not that it mattered much. The doctor said all of 308's blood, organs, tissue, and everything was used to create new creatures. McKeever said, show me. In a what? small anti-gravity aircraft, the human team was flown to a laboratory facility. The inside of the building was completely white. There were a lot of Evens walking around, all wearing blue clothing. When they were brought to the first lab, there were rolls of containers looking like glass bathtubs. Inside each bathtub were bodies. I was shocked, as were 7754 bodies strange looking bodies not human bodies at least not all of them we right. started walking down the space between the tubs we looked into the tubs these were hideous looking creatures this reminds me of the matrix movie i've only seen the uh, the first matrix movie that's the only one i've seen i have not seen the other matrix movies and, and you know when uh, he realizes uh when he awakens he realizes uh, that you were in our tubes and we are connected and shit like that. That's the, the vibe I'm getting. I do believe that somewhere uh, on our own planet, scientists are definitely studying and they are trying to experiment, trying to make different creatures happen. The, the thought alone is just insane. It is crazy. It, scientists are trying to play God, for sure. The first creature I see inside the tub looks like a porcupine. It appears to have a tube placed inside of it. The tube leads to a box underneath the tub. The next creature looks like nothing I can compare it to. It has blood red skin, two spots in the middle, maybe eyes, no arms or legs. It had a very strange odor. The next creature was human-like, but the skin was white, not skin white, the color white. The skin was wrinkled. 
The head was large with two eyes, two ears, and a mouth. The neck was very small. The head looked almost as if it sat on the lower torso. The chest was thin with large bone-like protrusions. The arms were curled with hands but no thumbs. The legs were also curled with feet but only three toes. I couldn't look at any more creatures. Next, they went to what the doctor called a growing room. Here they used parts of different species, including parts of the dead human, to create new species. Eva Chu said that parts of the blood and other organs are used to mix a substance that's placed inside the bodies. That was all Eva Chu could explain in English. They were breathing. They looked like humans, most of them. Two of the beings on the end looked like humans with dog heads. These beings... The, the idea of having like different civilization and different planets... It's just insane, right? But what's more insane is that if there is different life outside um, in the in the galaxy, how are they? What are their ways of living, right? Like, are they living like us, where they got families? Are they? And, and, and what are their? Do they have scientists like us? And if they do have scientists, are they really doing uh, stuff like that? It would just, the thought is just insane, right? And that's the story that they were doing all of this. Mm. We're not awake. They were either sleeping or drugged. They finally arrived at a growing chamber that contained an entity that was created using parts of 308's body. I was shocked. This being, with our teammates' blood and cells, looked like a large even, but the hands and legs were similar to humans. How could they have grown this being so quick? Obviously, this is well above our intelligence. I saw all I wanted to see. I told the doctor that we would like to leave. Ibatu saw that I was upset and touched my hand. Instantly, I felt concern. We traveled outside this building, a building that I did not wish to see again. I saw the dark side of this civilization. The Ibans are not the humane civilization we thought they were. And, and here's the thing, right? Maybe it's all about perception. Maybe to them, if this is really real, like, right? Like, let's uh, let's be objective about this. To them, they might be right. They might be like, "Yo, we're right," because everybody thinks they are right in their own mind, right? So to them, that was probably humane, or in their own words, ebans. But to the humans, seeing that shit was just batshit crazy, right? You see that, you're like, bro, what, 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 what the actual F they're doing? So to us, it's crazy. But to them, it's completely normal. They're like, what, what are you talking about? We do that every day. We've been doing that for years. To us, it's normal. That's not crazy. We do that. You're crazy if you think you... Uh, you're crazy if you never do that shit. That, that's the thing. It's always... You, you always think you're right in your mind. Because of the misunderstanding of even time, the 10-year mission was actually 13 years. During that time, McKeever and his team learned a lot about even culture. Even life was very regimented. As children mature, they're tested for aptitude and placed in jobs to which yep, they're most Alex. suited. All evens work part of the day, they rest part of the day, and even pray part of the day. Though the team never could figure out what kind of religion or spiritual beliefs they had. All manufacturing took place away from the even homes. Same with agriculture. Evens grew all their food hydroponically. The human team had taken about two years worth of food with them, and when that ran out, they tried to get accustomed to even food, which wasn't easy. Everything tasted like paper or chalk. No, it sounds like they learned how to cook for my second wife. Her cooking was terrible. How bad was it? <laughs> her cooking was so bad, we prayed after the meal. Good one. No, I tell you, her cooking was bad. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, the flies chipped in for a screen door. Ooh, the cooking was bad. I never wish any of you having a wife that cannot cook and clean, bro. That would be some Bruh. of the dumbest thing ever, man. I'm, uh, yeah, probably gonna get canceled after that one. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, probably gonna get canceled after that. But but let's be real, okay? Uh, damn. damn. How bad was it? Her cooking was so bad, I left dental floss in the kitchen, and all the roaches hung themselves. <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> Evens are vegetarian, but the humans wanted meat, and there were animals on the planet. As I mentioned uh, before, the, the Evens oh. allowed us to kill the beasts for meat. The meat isn't really bad. 899 says it tastes like bear, which I never ate. But Evens look at us very strange when we eat meat. They allow us to do just about anything we want, and eating meat is something we need for the protein. 
We use the last of our salt and pepper, which does make eating their food more of a challenge. The Ebens don't have anything similar. They do have an herb, as we call it, something like oregano, which they use. It has a tart taste, but we have developed a taste for it. The Ebens don't use money. All Ebens are required to work their assigned job and contribute to the community. There was a council of governors that controlled every single activity and every minute detail of the Ebens' lives. Food, clothing, furniture, everything is supplied. The Ebens go to a central distribution center and make a request, and we're given anything that they need. You know, I notice every time we do an alien story, they turn out to be hippie communists. Well, maybe it's a better way of life. Oh, yeah. Better for the people. And I, I saw the comment uh, in the chat right now. I, I'm not sure who said it, but somebody said it uh, that that's like us from the future. I don't know, man. It's an interesting uh, theory. Interesting. And maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. I guess we'll never know. Or maybe one day we will, if we are or not. The, 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 the thought here is that these are the stories that we're hearing, whether real or not. I, I feel like that in the future, we can really go in that path. We can be on a path where we have ended poverty. Uh, although I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think we will be uh, to be better to actually progress as a society and civilization. We would first have to put our differences aside. We cannot do that right now, which is sad. But one day, hopefully, uh, putting poverty aside, maybe uh, money will go away or not necessarily go away, but become a thing where, you know what, poverty is no longer a thing where at least everybody uh, can have at least somewhat decent amount more than livable amount right because right now yeah, yeah it's kind of tough for a lot of people uh Skizzle, could you check out the last tapes after this it's an amazing series it's free well uh, i'll check i'll try okay david uh I'll, i'm gonna look uh, after the stream off stream see if it's copyrighted or not and then i'll uh maybe next stream we can okay people in charge i got you man the humans noticed they were getting a heavy dose of radiation from the two suns and the heat was unbearable. It was consistently 120 to 130 degrees. Eventually, the humans were allowed to move further north. The climate was much more comfortable there in the 60s and 70s, and it was actually green. This environment didn't suit the Evens, but the humans loved it. After 13 years, the mission ended and eight of the 12 team members returned. 308 died on the way, and a pilot died in a vehicle crash. Two team members decided to stay on Serpo. When the remaining team members returned to Earth, they were quarantined and debriefed for an entire year. They were given new identities and large cash bonuses. Six team members retired and two returned to active duty. Most of the team developed illnesses due to the high dose of radiation they received on the planet and died pretty young. Colonel McKeever, the last surviving team member, retired to Florida. He passed away in 2002. But he leaves what is perhaps the most important legacy in human history. A 3,000 page report detailing every aspect of traveling to and living on an alien planet. Yet there are no monuments to him. No statues, no schools or streets bear his name. Colonel McKeever volunteered for this dangerous mission not for personal glory, but in service to all Americans and the entire human race. Maybe one day he'll be recognized as a great man. Stories like that are truly insane, right? I cannot wait. Either he's gonna say if the story is hoax or real, uh, we're gonna find out. But stories like that are great because A, it's fascinating if you're just listening to them to be entertained. Uh, it, it opens up the possibilities and you start to think, right? It's good in that way. You should not dismiss it, but you should not fully believe it. But the point here is that whenever somebody gives their close deathbed confessions i'm inclined to believe and whenever somebody comes out and gives a lot of detail uh, then either it's imagination or that shit for real happened right and third if they're not after the money then i'm more inclined to believe if they're after the money then you know they are trying to invent stories and uh you know you could be like jk rowling you can make your stories and become the next new harry potter or whatever right you, you can do that stories are fine but the problem is that do you want to believe them yeah that that's a hard part do you believe them though that's the hard part if they're not after money and they're telling you the story do you believe them do you not what do you do with that but sadly that day is not today The Project Serpo story has become legendary in the UFO community. It's firmly part of the lore. But is it real? To get to the truth of the Serpo story, there is a lot to unravel. And there are a couple of theories. The Project Serpo saga began in November 2005 
when someone named Request Anonymous emailed Victor Martinez, who ran a UFO mailing list. Anonymous said he was a retired U.S. government employee who was involved in a special program. Over the next nine months, he detailed the story you heard today. In the description, I'll link to a PDF of all his emails. It's 130 pages and covers every possible detail you can think of. The anonymous emails caused all kinds of drama. There was infighting, accusations, threats, and even a little bit of blackmail. The fighting all came down to, was Anonymous telling the truth? And if not, who was he and why was he doing this? After some excellent sleuthing from a couple of tech-savvy mailing list members, at least five separate email accounts, including Anonymous, were traced back to one man, the infamous Richard Doty. Doty? This guy again? Yep. Who's that? If you've seen our episodes about Paul Benowitz and Dulce Base, you'll be familiar with the name. Doty was an Air Force intelligence agent who specialized in spreading UFO. Okay, I feel like I've seen this face somewhere. I I believe uh, Bob Lazar had him. Oh, shit, I think, yeah. Oh, shit, oh, shit. Yeah, I think Bob Lazar had, or, or not Bob Lazar, uh, Dr. Steven Greer actually had him. Oh, shit, oh, shit. He has a white face, so I'm not sure if it's him or not. But damn, bro, that face is familiar, man. UFO disinformation. What he specifically tests? targeted Paul Benowitz, an Albuquerque businessman who thought he was intercepting messages from aliens. Doty also used respected UFO researchers like Bill Moore to spread disinformation throughout the entire UFO community. Yeah. Five different accounts, including Doty's, were emailing from the same internet provider from the same neighborhood in New Mexico. Now, to be fair to Doty, he- Yep, this is that guy. Guys, here's the thing. This guy has publicly confirmed that he has purposely uh, released misinformation uh, and he's the government official and it, it was one of his, uh, or if not, the main job, I think. I could be wrong. I do not know the exact details, but I watched the documentary and uh, yeah, he his job was to drop misinformation because people were coming out and telling aliens are real, UFOs are real, and his job was to drop a little bit of something in it so people that are believing it don't believe it right so he was dropping misinformation you know there is that meme uh, on twitter people always say when i purposely drop misinformation that's like the meme he really did really did that back in the days i mean i don't blame him it was his job right which is which is actually crazy but so he's a snake man um I mean, it was his job, so I don't blame, but but it's truly sad how they really tried and they actively are trying to suppress the truth. It truly is sad. I'm not mad at him directly. I'm more so sad by the entire effort that was behind uh, hiding the truth. Uh, but uh, what I'm thankful or I guess what I'm glad about, I guess, is that he came forward and he basically said, yup, we really did that. We put misinformation out there. Here's the thing, do you now believe him? Because he's coming out and says that I, I, what I was saying before was lies, now I'm speaking the truth. Do you really, do you want to believe him now versus before or do you not believe him? You know, it's one of those things. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to believe that he, he was spreading misinformation before, but the problem is that I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a believer in aliens, right? Like I do believe in aliens. So objectively speaking, when he comes out and says that, Yup, they really exist. I was spreading misinformation back then. I'm inclined to believe. I'm gonna let you know my bias right away. But 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 the thing is that I'm filling in the blanks. I guess we all fill, try to fill, fill in the blanks. My point here is that don't know if that's real or not, man. What you think on that, guys? He admits to being part of the disinformation campaign, but he also says that almost everything in the campaign was true. Roswell abductions, underground bases, yeah. and even the Project Serpo intergalactic exchange program. He said everything happened. When confronted oh, about shit. the IP address oh, issue, he got very angry and said that he could spoof any IP address he wanted to. Well, if that's true, why didn't he? Because in my opinion, before Doty was exposed, Doty didn't realize email headers contained IP addresses, nor did he know that IPs could be spoofed. Eventually, the Serpo story exposed what was called the Team of Five. Christopher Green, Harold Putoff, Richard C. Doty, Victor Martinez, and Bill Ryan. Several of them worked for the CIA and military intelligence. All of them contributed to the Serpo lore in some way. But did they create the lore? Mm. Probably not. Even though Richard Doty and the Team of Five propagated and added to the Serpo lore, 
A story about an alien exchange program has existed since the 1950s or 60s. In 2006, when Serpo was lighting up the UFO forums, a user named Chapman weighed in. He said he was formerly of the British Ministry of Defense and said he saw the Serpo files. Yes, the files okay. were real, but the events described in them were not. Oh, Chapman said the original Serpo story was created by Alice Bradley Sheldon. She had a successful career as a science fiction writer under the pseudonym James Tiptree Jr. She published a lot of books over a lot of years and was inducted into the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. She also happened to work for the CIA. During World War II, she worked for military intelligence and reached the rank of major, which was very high for women at the time. After the war, she joined the CIA. In the early 60s, the Soviets had successfully convinced the U.S. government that they had nuclear weapons hidden on American soil. The nukes were supposedly in abandoned mines near large American cities and could be activated by sleeper agents. Damn. This wasn't true, but it wouldn't be completely disproved until 1980. Project Serpo was a response to this piece of intelligence. The CIA wanted to scare the Russians into thinking the United States had acquired advanced technology and was becoming friendly with aliens, and the Soviets might want to think twice about detonating a nuclear weapon. At first, the Serpo story worked. The KGB was nervous. But the story became more convoluted and started to sound like a cheesy sci-fi novel. Humans, man. Humans. This is one of those things. Communication, ladies and gentlemen. Communication. The crazy part here is that the most important thing with these conflicts here is that you don't want to tell the your enemy what you know you want to always i guess art of war right you always want to want to keep them on the edge even if you're weak you want to appear strong if you're strong you want to uh, appear weak uh, logical but 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 damn man this is exactly why aliens don't visit us man we're really thinking about war all the time bros this made the kgb suspicious then the cia added photographs to the story the russians didn't buy it the serpo story had been forgotten for years but resurfaced when Richard Doty and the Air Force perpetrated a very aggressive disinformation campaign against the UFO community. The purpose of this campaign was to flood the community with more and more outlandish stories. Eventually, UFO believers didn't know what was true and what wasn't. Some UFO researchers turned on each other. It was chaos and a highly successful intelligence operation. Then, over the years, Richard Doty goes from counterintelligence agent to UFO believer to keynote speaker at UFO conventions. A part of me wants to believe him, to give yeah. Doty the benefit of the doubt. He Change of hearts, maybe? I, I know one of you said that in the in the chat. You, Captain, what's up? Gen C, Chapo, Mac Juicy, Mr. Two Times, uh, Liam, welcome on in. But change of hearts? But, but here's the thing, man. Most people will have doubts, though. If you're publicly coming out and you're saying that you spread misinformation, and then all of a sudden you are you 180 and you say that, yeah, I spread misinformation, and then you're like, yeah, aliens, UFOs, everything happened, intergalactic stuff happened. Are people really going to believe you? That's the thing. Some will, for sure. But people that used to believe you back then, when you were spreading misinformation, when you were saying that, yeah, aliens, not real, UFOs, not real, they would have probably believed you, but now they would have been mad at you, and they would have probably be like, yeah, I don't believe the new you. I, I do not have anything directly at him. I, this was his job, like I said earlier. CIA in a nutshell, yeah, it was his job, so I don't blame him. It's basically the, the people behind... Uh, who were in control is who I blame in this. He was just basically doing his job, which is which is sad, right? They are suppressing the truth. We're not talking. We talked about GTA 6 leaks earlier. We're not talking about GTA 6 leaks, guys. This is bigger than that. I guess you understand this, right? This is bigger than a video game leak, man. He claims to this day to have nothing to do with Serpo. But if he's telling the truth, why is he making fake internet accounts? Why is he flooding the internet with the Serpo story? When Anonymous, a.k.a. Richard Doty, began posting about Serpo, the story was simple. But then it got more and more elaborate. Anonymous was even answering questions from the group. What this did was flood the group with outlandish information. The members didn't know what to believe and they turned on each other. The same operation Doty ran in the 80s, and the same result. There is no physical evidence to prove that Serpo actually happened. But there's also no evidence to debunk it. Damn. We don't know for sure if it was made up by the CIA. Whether you believe it's true or you believe it's fake, it doesn't really matter. All we have are theories. We do know that Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, but it's what's called a wide binary system. The stars are a light year apart, so there's no way that photo is correct. Also, it's highly unlikely that humans could eat food on an alien planet. 
In such a different biome, literally everything would be toxic. But Whitley Schrieber, Bob Lazar, and a few other whistleblowers say Serpo happened. Betty and Barney Hill are maybe the most famous UFO abductees of all time. And they said the aliens who abducted them were from Zeta Reticuli. Damn. Are all these people lying? Are they just building on a story that has evolved over the past 60 years? Or is there a planet out there somewhere inhabited by an intelligent race of beings living in peace, caring for one another, thinking back fondly on the time the strange earth creatures came to visit? And if the Ebens are real, you can't help but wonder, what does that alien human hybrid look like? Mm, man, W video, W video. I love his videos, man. That's the thing, man. Guys, click on this video and I will see you right there.